Okay. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar on a Friday afternoon, uh, hosted by the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, I'll, I'll give a little introduction as people are joining. I, I anticipate a few more people will be rolling in since it's just now 3 p.m. But um, I'm Alexandra Kasiba. I'll be moderating the webinar today. And if I haven't uh, met you virtually or in person, um, unlikely with COVID, I'm the, the fairly recently hired climate forester for uh, forest parks and recreation. And in the future, I'll be uh, expect to see more of these kinds of events that really focus on what we know about impacts to uh, our forests and our forest sector from climate change. And so we're very, Happy to have a presentation today on climate adaptation in the Northeast forest product supply chain. So a couple things as people are joining, you'll know, be automatically muted, as you can see. Um, and a few uh, kind of housekeeping items for those who aren't as familiar with this GoTo webinar platform, as I am in that same camp. Um, it's set up a little differently than maybe Teams or Zoom you might be familiar with. There is a chat uh, feature, but it's not really a chat that you can get uh, access um, other participants. That chat feature is really just for us to provide you with announcements. If you have a question, and we really encourage questions for, for Dr. Bick, is you add that to the question um, section down below. Um, so you can pop in your question. Only I will be able to see that, and, and Gwen, who's also here, um, facilitating this webinar. And at the end, we'll have some time to uh, ask Steve those questions. So please, at any time during his presentation, pop questions in that question box. Um, and the webinar will be recorded, is already being recorded, um, and will be posted on our Vermont Woods. And I'll, I'll, I'll post that link. It will also, uh, that information will be shared with you following the webinar too. So automatically when the webinar is over, you'll get that information as well as in an email. Um, the webinar recording will be posted on the Vermont Forest, Forestry Webinar Library and allows folks looking for continuing education credits for a Vermont Forester license to get credits um, after the fact. And we are providing various continuing education credits for this webinar. So uh, Society of American Foresters, LEAP, Logging Education, uh, to advance professionalism credit and uh, Vermont Forester license. So there will be a survey that um, automatically comes up at the end of the webinar, as well as in an email that will ask you for information on which credits you need. Uh, and if so, there might be other information that we need will be prompted in that survey, for example, for your uh, license number. So we'll be submitting those on your behalf um, and you will be able to get credit for attending this webinar. All right, just in that time I was talking, we we're up to 72 people. This is great. I love to see all the interest in this webinar. So just again, for people who just joined, um, please submit questions at any time um, in the question section uh, um, in the, the panel that you have for GoToWebinar. Um, not everyone will be able to see those questions, only myself and Gwen, and we will uh, have some time at the end of Steve's webinar to um, ask him those questions. The chat function isn't really what we think of of a normal chat. It's really just for announcements. So um, that's not a great way to uh, get questions to Steve. Use the question uh, section. And you will be prompted at the end for a survey uh, for uh, continuing education credits, as well as um, you'll get that automatically in your email, including links to the webinar recordings. All right, well, um, the numbers have slowly tapered off, so I think we're gonna start um, the, the webinar. So I'm here to uh, introduce Steve. We are very thankful for Dr. Bick to be here and present his work on the uh, climate adaptation in the Northeast forest product supply chain. So Steve Bick is a forestry consultant who works with landowners, forest product businesses, and public agencies on research and extension projects. 
He and his family split time between their home in the Adirondacks and a cabin in North Faston, where he serves as a director of the Vermont Forest Business School. Steve spent a large portion of 2019 working on a cooperative agreement with the Forest Service to look at climate adaptation in the forest product, product supply chain. And he'll be sharing the results of that project with us today. So thanks, Steve, for being here. And I will pass it off to you. Th thanks, Allie. I, I appreciate the opportunity to share this. Uh, you know, we finished this up right before the pandemic, and there really hasn't been an opportunity to speak about it up, up to this point. So I, I'm glad for that for that chance. So as, as Ali mentioned, I'll talk with you about climate change in the forest product supply chain. And, and just to clarify uh, what I mean by the supply chain is really everything from the stump to mill. So the primary chain, and we didn't take it any further than that. And I didn't look at any any uh, secondary processing or any 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 farther downstream than than that. So this was a cooperative agreement with the Forest Service uh, to do this uh, project and look into the, these things. Uh, the four, you know, a cooperative agreement with the Forest Service. This webinar is not a product of that agreement. It's something that came about later. And as I learned earlier this week, there's a little bit of a process to uh, get permission to include the Forest Service's logo. Uh, but I want to credit, I want to credit them for being involved, even though I didn't follow that process. So it was a stand-in for the Forest Service and for for Al Steele in particular. This is an important day for Al because uh, this project was his his idea. And uh, he came to me, I think it was 2017, we first started talking and it took about, oh, a year and a half to, uh, to really fine tune what we wanted to do in terms of, of, um, of looking at it. And, and also involved were uh, the Northeast Climate Hub, Dave Hollinger and Aaron Lane provided us with a lot of advice. And when you, uh, in my experience, when you work with the wood utilization people at the Forest Service, they are quick to say, how can we involve Paul Frederick in this project and his, his department? So, you know, Paul came on kind of as an advisor. So FPR was in part a sponsor on this uh, and uh, and were, you know, instrumental in helping me move this along. We did uh, talk to people from Pennsylvania through Maine, but we talked to an awful lot of people in Vermont. I spent a lot of time in Vermont uh, in particular to look at people. So. You know, my stand-in for Al Steele is is this Glenwood parlor stove, and uh, if you think that you know a stove like this is kind of old and outdated, while at the still, same time still being sort of useful to have around, you know maybe that's an allegory for Al Steele. But really, it's 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 just a stove. I'm going to let it go at that. Uh, this project we did, you know, we did follow all the necessary guidelines. So I'm not going to read this statement, but I wanted to be sure to in, to include it here. So in in shaping this up and talking with Al and with Paul Frederick and others, we identified some some commonly accepted consequences of climate change that we thought would impact the forest product supply chain, and and said these are the things we want to look at. So we've got seasonal changes in temperatures changes in average monthly precipitation. Uh, as a result of those things, we've got different soil moisture patterns than we've seen uh, in past decades. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, we have mud season uh, or a longer mud season or additional mud seasons that we didn't have before. And certainly that was a, an important topic of uh, discussion. Storm events and their frequency and intensity has changed. That has some impacts. Uh, we have exacerbated, or climate change has, uh, forest pest diseases and invasive species. So uh, the forest product supply chain is dealing with that in ways that maybe it didn't in the past, or maybe it had a different set of challenges in the past. And then I look briefly at a couple of policies related to climate and how they have a direct impact on the forest product supply chain. So in doing this, and I think it was, uh, you know, well, it was Paul Frederick who very early on said, okay, great, we finally got this together. How are we gonna do it? And so we had to had to come up with a plan. And I, I think Aaron Lane suggested that we take a close look at the NOAA data. And I did that for the Northeast states at the at the county level. County level is uh, probably as good as good good a data as there was available, but at the same time it's a little bit coarse. If you think 
think about Vermont and the differences in elevations from one end of some counties to the other. You've got you know the high elevations in the Green Mountains, but then you're down on Lake Champlain or over on the Connecticut River Valley. So we've got some real extremes even within counties. So we looked at that data to inform our discussions. And then, um, then I was going to do one-on-one -on -one interviews and, and focus groups with, uh, I think we did four focus groups all together. Uh, by the time we were done, we'd spoken with 76 different people, either individually or in groups. Some of these interviews went on for two and a half or three hours. And we just got a, a you know, wealth of information for people. You know, in terms of how to start this conversation, I think there was a little bit of perception, at least among some people, that you know we're, we're dealing with the private sector, with some small business people who may or may not be conservative, and maybe they're not going to be so sure that climate change is real. And I, and I want to tell you that uh, I didn't meet any of those people, okay? These are people on the ground who have dealt with these changes over time and adapted to them. So you know, th there wasn't a need to convince anybody of, of anything. Uh, in, in talking with working landscape people, it's not a great idea to go in and say, you know, 99% of scientists agree, so you should probably get on board with this, whatever I'm going to say next. So I tried to tried to stick away from, steer away from that. And I was fortunate in that almost everyone I approached about an interview was happy to talk with me and and share uh, share their experience. Uh, about the time I was starting to schedule interviews, we'd gotten a lot of this county level data together and we thought maybe it's a good idea to get something about this study out there. So we, we published an article in the uh, Northern Logger magazine that just talked about the general trends and changes we'd seen in, uh, in temperature and precipitation. You know, I guess I needed this as much as anyone because I wasn't quite sure. I, I knew there were changes, but I didn't know what they were. And uh, telling someone that, hey, it's, it's two degrees on average, it's two degrees warmer than in 1900, really doesn't tell them much of anything. But if you tell them that it's four degrees warmer in December than it was a couple of decades ago, well, that's pretty significant. So we put this article out and uh, Allison Berry, who is um, a frequent a work colleague of mine, was the lead author on this. And everyone else involved uh, you know had some had some input this this helped pave the way for some of the conversations that we had and in terms of the NOAA data and what we found when we looked at things uh, we grouped we grouped this data by the, the northern forest states and then southern New England and Pennsylvania we put together because the trends were about the same the trends are the same uh, the same across the board just slightly different conditions in both so as you as we looked at this I have uh, I've highlighted the numbers that seemed really significant. So if we look at January, and, and I compared the 1980s, or we compared the 1980s with the 2010s, uh, and the absence of any other direction on this, I entered the industry in the 1980s, so that was, that was really relevant for me. So compared to when I first started, January's are 3.6 degrees warmer. That's a key time of the year for the forest product supply chain. It's when a lot of harvests are scheduled and completed, and they're done in places where we need cold weather to have access and to protect the ground and so on. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more about that a little bit farther along here. February is not much different, but if you don't get the January freeze you need, then you maybe don't have the conditions that you need in, in February. It's a little bit warmer in May, but that didn't jump out as being especially important. Look at September, though. It's three and a half degrees warmer. And by and large, that's thought of as a good thing. We have come to uh, think of September as the driest month in many locations around the Northeast. Well, October comes along, it's still warmer, but if you look down in the lower column, we're getting an inch and a half more precipitation than we got in the past. And an inch and a half at a time of the year, and we know what happens in the fall, right? The, the leaves fall off, it does cool off a bit, we get less direct, you know, the days are shorter, less sunshine, so that water, that may have evaporated or run off starts to puddle up. And we go from those ideal September conditions to a fall mud season. Now, depending on who we talk with, you either recognize that there was always a fall mud season or maybe we have a, a more significant one than we have in the past, and that's important. We get to December, which in some places should be the start of winter. It's 4.6 degrees warmer. You couple that with uh, almost an inch and a half more precipitation that 
might come as rain instead of snow. And suddenly that two weeks of winter weather we may have been counting on in the supply chain to, to increase supplies, especially coming off of a period when, when mills didn't get a whole lot of wood in because we had that mud season. Uh, and then we've got a, a real challenge there. One other thing I guess I wanted to note there, June, June gets an inch more rain than it has in the past, and, and this may come in, in, in pretty big events. So what's happening in that, you know, we always had the spring mud season, but sometimes we get an early dry out and, and um, operations proceed, harvesting starts, and then we're shut down again because we've got, you know, soil moisture conditions that won't tolerate harvesting. The logging chance is changing. That was a quote from uh, one of the people that we interviewed, and it's one that really struck me. Logging chance is a really an old school forestry term. It, it, uh, it used to really mean uh, a description of an individual harvesting site. It's come to mean more of the sum of the, of the, the variables that impact how you might harvest and I liked it so much, I actually went out and bought that domain name and started to use it. This is uh, the same comparison only done for Southern New England and, uh, and Pennsylvania grouped together. S same pattern, maybe a average temperatures are probably a, a bit warmer. Uh, and you know, the first step towards change is awareness, the second is acceptance. I think if we look at uh, this time period, the 1980s through the 2010s, you know, we started to see real change in the 90s. And at first, at least, I, I think among some of the people I spoke with, there was this idea that, well, it's always fluctuated, and maybe it's not that big a deal. And it, it took a number of years for us to realize, oh, things really are different. It, ju it isn't just a question of uh, three soft winters in a row or some rainier summer, something like that. So in terms of lesser winters, looking at the county level data, uh, you know, in the 1980s, and I kind of arbitrarily chose, not arbitrarily, I think I made an informed choice, 20 degrees, an average winter temperature, an average January temperature of 20 degrees or less means that you get freezing cold nights that uh, help you get the ground conditions you need for harvesting. Uh, landowners can get things done that they had planned, mills can get supply in, and loggers are happy because they're, they're working. So using that 20 degrees as a, as a benchmark there, uh, it turns out we have 30 fewer counties in the northern forest states that have January average temperatures of 20 degrees or less. So if you look at the, the map, the 1980s versus the 2010s, suddenly that southern tier just kind of drops out of there, and we know we're going to have softer conditions. Similar pattern is true of December's. You know, December can't always be counted on or couldn't always be counted on for good cold winter conditions, but some of the time it could. And in certain years, you gotta, you gotta jump on the season and, and got a couple of weeks of production or so that you might not, not otherwise have had. Well, there's 39 fewer, you know, in the, in, for December, I used an average of 25 degrees or less. Just, just hoping you're getting some of those days down in the single digits or maybe down to zero where you can freeze things in place. So we have 39 fewer counties uh, in the 2000s did in the 1980s with that being the case so you know armed with this better understanding of of changes in the seasonal conditions being able to have that conversation with people uh, we identified some topic areas that, that are pr pretty closely aligned with the changes that we wanted to talk about in, in interviews and th these interviews were largely unstructured. If somebody's willing to talk with you and you can steer the conversation, that's great. But uh, for the most part, uh, I steered a little bit and listened a lot and recorded and went back through things. So we wanted to talk about impacts on forest management and harvest scheduling in particular, on logging practices and best management practices for water quality or AMPs as you will call them in, in Vermont. Uh, how has this impacted uh, the logging equipment that's being used? Are there changes in the roads and other parts of the forest infrastructure? And that, that's pretty closely aligned with BMPs. How have procurement strategies uh, changed uh, to, to account for this um, changes in seasonal patterns that might mean changes in harvesting and production? And then uh, what role are pests and invasives playing in, in, in all this? How, how are they dictating things? So we, we ask questions related to these, to these items. So in terms of harvest scheduling, what we found is that uh, it's more challenging. 
you know, in Vermont, a lot of lands are in current use. You have to have a schedule that's supplied. Uh, the programs are a little bit different in other states. Uh, you've got a big window in Vermont and New York. We have to tell them in our 40A, what year are you going to harvest? Well, that gets altered quite a bit over time because you plan on something and then don't have the conditions that allow you to do it or don't have the availability of contractors because of the conditions. So harvest scheduling is, is important uh, and it's more challenging. Uh, one of the big land managers told me we've gotten better at picking where we go and when. In fact, in their forest inventories, you know, in addition to looking at species composition and volumes and things like that, they're, they're putting ratings on, on different stands to indicate when might excuse me, when might be the best time to harvest? What time of the year is this available? We used to say su summer and winter, and now, now it's divided out into four different seasons for, for those purposes. Uh, as one person told me, getting at the right place at the right time of the year and matching the harvest to the seasonality is difficult. In the past, they might have really planned on the season, and now it's more a question of, okay, when is it possible? and When can we do things? If we look at that the, the photo I've got there, so here's a shelterwood harvest, and this is just about a half mile from where I'm sitting right now, and it it took place in September, and I was pretty, there's a little mud there, but nothing's going anyplace, and I was pretty happy with how things turned out, and of course, I pushed my luck and said, well, you know what, we have a little more we can do here, and I said that on about September 25th, and so we were there for 10 more days, and that quickly turned into a situation where uh, I I wished I hadn't done it. We had an awful lot of mud and you couldn't couldn't even walk through it. In terms of the infrastructure uh, and, and the way we're operating on our forests, we're seeing more improvements to gravel roads. Uh, you know, one of the things that went on in this time period that's not especially climate related was that we shifted to whole tree harvesting by and large around the Northeast. That's the primary ground-based harvesting system. And so, you know, the climate adaptation is a sub-story in that. But as a result of that high capital investment, we wanted to get bigger loads out. And so we needed to, uh, you know, it may have been the first time harvests were done in certain locations where we needed to get tractor trailers in before they had been done with, you know, triaxles or, or, or tandem trucks and that sort of thing. So we wanted to get bigger trucks in. We needed, we needed to upgrade the roads. And that's an expensive thing to do. We're starting to see more uh, more gravel roads and then and then more crushed stone. Uh, crushed stone can solve a lot of problems. And I, and I know some landowners that I spoke with and others I've observed that they they kind of you know pick their pick their worst spot, improve it with crushed stone. And if you do keep doing that and, and fix the worst spot every year, pretty soon you've got a, roads that don't wash out and that hold up to traffic better. The other thing we're seeing is is uh, upgraded upgraded winter road systems. Uh, let me, let me, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. We're using bigger culverts because we get more flash events. That was one of the quotes from people. I think the biggest mistake people have always made on roads is to undersize their culverts. Well, as BMPs came in, we had more guidance at, at that, but we also needed to have larger culverts. But this idea of upgraded winter road system is interesting, interesting to me in particular, because here in the Southwest Adirondacks where I live, you know, when I started working, winter roads were everything. And, and, and I should probably, not being sure who's in the group, I should explain that uh, a little bit more. A winter road is a road that has no gravel, or it might be a light duty truck road that wouldn't support a truck, and we freeze it in place. And that's why we need those really cold nights, ideally starting in December. If you're gonna freeze a road in place that you hope to, to use through the middle of March, you need cold weather. And the road itself is a combination of snow, ice, and mud with the proper drainage put in. And what we're seeing is, is two things. Because we have shorter winter seasons, and less certainty about them, some of the big landowners are doing what they're calling an improved winter road. Uh, and, and by that, I mean a road that has looks very much like a, a standard gravel road, only it doesn't have the gravel. So by spending more time getting that road ready, then when they do have a window of opportunity, you know, they're not starting from scratch. It's just a question of getting the snow off, driving the frost in, maybe hitting the road with a drag and freezing it in place. So uh, the general consensus is, there is, is that there are fewer people that have those winter road skills around. We're, we're losing those skills. 
Here's a picture of my friend Bruce. I took this photo uh, last week. I visited him. He was working in a remote spot called the Raymond Hills, which is about as far as you can get from anything in that part of the Adirondacks. And I was last there with him in 1993. I sold some timber there then. He froze the road in. His nephew's up there working now, and, and you, couldn't, you couldn't keep Bruce away, but you, you needed him because he had the skills to put the road in place. And while we were there, we looked at a site of an old logging camp from 1948. So that's the frequency there. There was a camp in there they harvested in 48. He and I were in there in 93, and uh, his nephew is up there now harvesting. So, you know, if you're looking at every 40 or 50 years going in, you know, maybe it's 30 since they were there last, then it's not going to justify putting a gravel road in because you're not going to have another reason to go in there. So uh, what I heard from people is we don't have... Uh, that knowledge, we're losing it, it's dying out, the people who know how to freeze winter roads. doesn't mean we still can't do it, it just means you've got to make it easier, or maybe the landowner is taking care of that instead of the logging contractor. Okay, so water quality AMPs, as you folks in Vermont call them, they're called BMPs everywhere else. Uh, the funny thing is yours are probably stricter than the ones that are called the best management practices. But depending on where you are in the region, we first started talking about these in the 90s. And I, I talked to quite a few people uh, in these interviews who, who chuckled a little bit and said, BMPs, we remember when we were saying, what are those? Well, as it happens, they came about, you know, they, they you know, widespread compliance efforts really came about region wide in 2000. I think you were ahead of the game in Vermont. And uh, they came about at a time when we needed them most because we were seeing changes in soil moisture patterns, while at the same time, the larger story is that uh, because of the nature of the resource, we were going to larger equipment, uh, more mechanized, really whole tree harvesting for the most part is that it's the dominant harvesting system. And I'll, I'll talk about cut to length in a little while. Well, if you make that sort of capital investment in equipment, you need to work a lot to pay for it. And so while we needed to have people working a lot, we also found that, hey, we're getting less cooperation in ground conditions. So how can how do we resolve that? One of the ways you do it is following, you know, following best management practices. It used to be, oh, that just means cleaning up at the, at the end. And now it's kind of something you've got to integrate into the daily operations. Uh, the adoption of BMPs is a, is a great success story for the region. We can all be proud uh, of, of the progress that's been made there, and, but it's been a necessity. If, uh, you know, I think one equipment dealer I spoke with said, these guys really need about 40 operating weeks a year to pay for that equipment, make a profit. And I wanna tell you, I know people that work 40 weeks in a year, and to do that, you're either an exceptionally good planner and project manager, or maybe you're pushing the envelope in terms of water quality. So we need these BMPs and they came along at a good time. When you look at the BMP manager, this, you know, some of the people I, I, I spoke with were really profound in what they said. And this was one of the best quotes. When you look at the BMP manual, there are structural BMPs, but there are a lot of behavioral BMPs and the opportunity costs associated with those go uncompensated. And I've been beating that drum for for a while now. Uh, there was always talk, you know, when I was in grad school in Virginia in the 90s, it was like, okay, there's BMPs and the, and what do these things actually cost? And it occurs to me then that it's not that hard to know what it costs to put in a portable bridge or to put in, um, you know, a water bar or something like that. The larger cost is lost production. When you shut down because you can't operate, uh, you know, your, your equipment payments still go on. So there's some real costs there. And I think there's some people that are, are starting to recognize that. Now, this is the, the commercial shameless plug part of the webinar where I, where I tell you that the new Northern Logger app is out. I just completed this. And the reason I bring it up is because I incorporated a lot of the, uh, to the extent that I could, I took AMP guidelines for Vermont and incorporated them in there for things like culvert sizing and so on. Okay, now back to the regular program. So I talked a little bit about uh, about harvest scheduling, what landowners are doing, what to, you know how BMPs play a role there, and I want to talk more specifically about logging because this is you know the middle of the chain and in a lot of ways can be the weakest link. 
So uh, I, I talk with a, quite a variety of logging contractors. Uh, you know, I mentioned that that uh, whole tree harvesting is widespread in the region. And I talked to, to one guy who's been at this since the 70s. He said the skitter was the best fuel I ever made, less fuel, less men. So, so if you can picture in a whole tree harvest with grapple skitters, what you're getting is a, a heavy impact, but on a smaller area because uh, the trees are cut and bunched by another machine. And what he found was with a six wheel machine, and he's very much on an appropriate uh, land base for this, uh, he did a lot better. In the 90s, he managed to move 0.43 tons per gallon, and now he's doing 1.1 tons per gallon. Some of that's technology, and, and, you know, in the, in the engines and so on, but, but going to this bigger machine helped. Now, how does he reconcile that with water quality? Well, in a whole tree harvest, the whole trees come to the landing, and you merchandise them into products, and in some cases, you will chip the tops and sell them for a low-value product. In his case, he doesn't do any of it. He, make, he made a conscious business decision to take all that top wood and bring it back and put it in his trails for flotation. And if he gains, you know, days of the week at certain times of the year, or if he gains a couple week on a couple weeks on either end of the season, then that has a significant impact for him. Uh, Cut to length has found a role in the Northeast logging world uh, that's in part been influenced by climate adaptation. Uh, carrying wood out, you know, so so I'm a, I'm a big advocate for the 80-20 rule, and I would say 80% of the of the uh, water quality concerns on a harvest harvesting site take place in the skidding part of the operation. So so in just one aspect of what's being done, with a forwarder you carry the wood out rather than dragging it. As a result, you know, in the winter you might uh, freeze your trail in place a little bit better. There's uh, a little bit of a misconception that you can't make ruts with a with a forwarder, uh, and uh, you sure can. But uh, there are situations in which you can gain working time as a result, or work at certain times of the year, or at certain days when you might not otherwise be able to. to so to that extent, that has helped make uh, a system that might be marginal in certain locations make it a, a winner. A cut to length is uh, the best harvesting system out there, except when it's not. So it's it's a really great system in a lot of situations, and, and in some situations, it's just not a good fit. So what we've come to have is different expectations of the winter. It's uh, uh, more start-stop logging than we've had in the past. It behaves like other times of the year where we sort of knew you'd be able to work a few days and then things got soft and you couldn't, but it's hard to make plans around that. And, and uh, you know, one of the one of the people I spoke with said, you've got to get this whole winter idea out of your head. We have year round mud season where we are. And he was in one of those, if you remember back to my county maps, one of those areas, you know, just out just outside of that. There are places where, you know, it looks, says it's winter on the calendar, but it's not really. And if I can find it, I have a good quote here. There's places where winter still does where we, what we want it to, but those places are fewer than they, than they have been in the past. So this was a situation, and that, that photo is not one of mine, but was taken on Tug Hill, in the Tug Hill region in New York. And if you know that region at all, we associate it with snow and long winters. And there was snow, but underneath there wasn't, there wasn't any frost. And I, I think they, had, a, they got, had not one but two machines stuck there. You know, this was kind of a secondhand quote. One of the foresters told me that, uh, you know, I think this was on a state, a state job in Vermont. Uh, he told the contractor, "Well, look, you can't you can't keep operating unless you put some stone in here." And he said, "I'd rather buy ten loads of stone than be out of work for a week." So, you know, we're finding out really how important it is to work when people will take the steps necessary to make it possible. Incidentally, that was a quote I had uh, one for, I had a lot of great quotes from people and uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember which ones gave me permission to to attribute them just yet. So I won't tell you who this person was, but I was urged to speak with him by a number of people and I reached out and I wasn't getting anywhere because, you know, like most foresters, he just wanted to be left alone to do his work. And I, I don't fault him there, but I'm glad that I did get in touch with him. It was, it was two years ago this week. It was he came in on President's Day for an hour 
except it turned into three hours, and I probably got more insight from this guy than, than anyone else I, I spoke with. The other thing about logging is, and it's uh, definitely an added cost, but excavation equipment has become a must. I, I, I heard that across the region. It's hard to be a logger unless you have a bulldozer or an excavator because it's not just a question of cleanup. You need to follow BMPs right along to keep, you know, to keep operating. This is uh, one of one Vermont logger told me I saw I saw the writing on the wall before you know AMPs were voluntary but once they made them uh, mandatory on current use properties you know which is going to be for most people half of where they work I would guess then then they had to be prepared to do whatever is necessary to keep working otherwise you're going to be moving around a lot. One other thing I want to say on logging you know I talked about. The, the one person I and I got great insight from the people at at the New York City watershed, the Agricultural Council that that work in the Catskills and really encourage BMPs. One of those folks told me, you know, that that idea that there's permanent permanent mud season and and that um, you you've got to think about windows of opportunity to work. One of the loggers they brought in to talk with me said, we don't even think about the days of the week anymore. We just work on the days we can work which is you know, a great adaptation, but think about that in terms of a small business and family life and the stress that puts on things. And it's one thing if you're the business owner. If you're just an employee and suddenly there are, you don't have a predictable schedule, that's difficult. And, and it's much easier to go to work somewhere else. So it makes it harder to get employees. In terms of wood, wood procurement, I had uh, I had great conversations with people here and and how their strategies has, has have changed because they can't count on the the uh, flow of wood in quite the same pattern that it that it's been in the past. Uh, again, I I I got some people to to mention their names and one of them was was Colleen Goodrich and and many of you know her and and as far as I'm concerned, she and her family epitomize everything that's great about Vermont. Uh, so she runs, you know, probably the premier white cedar sawmill in the in the region. And she told me, if you don't get the logs, it doesn't matter how many orders you have, right? You can't you can't sell what you don't have. So here here she and her family are are using white cedar that mostly grows on wet sites. So primarily they get their supply in the winter. And if you don't get a good winter, they might not get enough supply. Fortunately, the supply lasts. They can hold it, you know, for a year or however long they need to. But she's done some interesting things to make sure she has enough wood. You know, if you want to sell her a pickup load of wood, she'll buy it. That's not much supply, but maybe you'll have two pickups next year or or ten trailer loads a few years from now. So she encourages uh, supply from anyone whenever they want to bring it in. The hardwood sawmills, in particular, in the region, have have found some interesting ways to help guarantee their supply and, and do it in a way that helps the loggers deal with um, with some of the changes they're seeing. They're providing uh, AMP and BMP assistance as part of their strategy. Now, it's one thing to do that when they buy the timber and they have contract loggers, they should do that. But other people who are their suppliers uh, can often find the loan of a bridge. I, I talked to one major sawmill in the region and he said, I think we have 30 bridges now. We're loaning them out all the time. And of course, they wear out and we, we order new ones. And there's even a few of them. They don't like to do it, but they'll help their suppliers with uh, the sort of things they might be a little bit better at, like filling out a permit application or doing some mapping or that sort of thing. And talking to uh, the paper mills in the region, and remember, most of our wood is low grade. It doesn't all go to the sawmills. Uh, if you're in Vermont, you're you don't have any integrated pulp and paper mills, so your wood's going to Maine or it's going to New York. And uh, one of the procurement people I talked to there said he's got kind of a nimble suite of strategies that he draws from in in supplying in supplying the mill. He's got limited space in the yard. He wants to keep it fill, keep it full, but he's also got pressure not to have too much money tied up in wood because you you know you're fighting the battle at both ends in the field and, and administratively. So you know, he'll use supply contracts. He'll extend his supply areas. You know, that's just buying wood from farther away. And uh, that farther away wood is the first one that tends to get shut off because they pay a little bit more, you know, when they truck it farther. 
a remote wood chip yard. So they've got a chipping yard somewhere where people bring round wood in and then that value added product gets bought, brought to the mill. Uh, they keep close tabs on backhaul and when they can see when trucks are coming back empty from somewhere and can bring them, whether it's uh, you know pulpwood or chips from a sawmill, that sort of thing. They even leverage, uh, you know, we won't sell you logs off our land if your sawmill doesn't supply us with chips, which is, you know, if you have leverage, you use it. And the other innovative thing they're doing is financing young loggers. They're they're looking at the future and who's going to be supplying us. You know, most of the country, let alone the logging workforce, is getting closer to, to retirement or there's a big bulge there anyway. Who's going to replace them? Who's going to want to come into this industry? So they've actually... Uh, identified some young people, financed a grapple skitter for them, which is, and and then through their landowner assistance program, made sure to put put wood in front of them to harvest. So, uh, you know, as, as this guy called it, he has a nimble approach. He'll do a little bit of everything to make sure that he gets enough wood. All right, I talk with, with pretty much everyone or tried to talk about policies. I want to tell you that people that work for public agencies do not want to talk about policies. And then the others, you know, we often had to, how does this impact you? And the, the main one in the region, uh, the main visible one was uh, really renewable energy credits. So, you know, without renewable energy credits, you don't make electricity out of wood. These markets, you know, the, whether it's a Burlington Electric or a Rygate or, or a, you know, a bunch of smaller operations from New York all the way up into Maine, uh, you know, that market provides a great opportunity for forest landowners to get rid of low-grade stems, particularly in places where we don't have strong pulp markets. And a, a, you know, one more product, if you're doing whole tree harvesting, you've got uh, the treetops are coming to the landing anyway, and if you're near a mill, maybe you can uh, you have one more revenue stream. So those markets make a huge difference. What we're seeing now, and, and this has happened you know, since I've talked with these people, is... Uh, you know, when fossil fuel prices come down, it's less attractive to make energy out of wood. And then, you know, as near as I can tell, the, the new climate law in New York is going to not count wood as renewable. And so I think we're going to see those markets disappear. The other policy we talked about, and this has a, a pretty uh, important impact, is very much a local one. Uh, with the changes in the weather and also some cultural shifts, Road supervisors have gotten less tolerant of trucking during any time of the year, more so in the winter. So local roads get posted for weight. Local roads also lead to forests where people are harvesting. So, uh, you know, we're suddenly we're seeing, um, you know, some roads getting posted in January or any time the temperature goes above 20 degrees. And that causes some, some stress if you've invested in moving equipment or if you're a mill and you bought timber on a certain road and are counting on getting, out, getting it out in a certain month. Part of this change has been, a, a, I think, a cultural shift. And from talking with others, uh, in years past, yes, they always posted the road. And generally speaking, you could go to the road supervisor. It was getting towards the end of a winter. And you could have a conversation with someone who was very much like you, work with equipment, may have worked in the woods in the past, and say, look, how about if we wait for the few cold nights and we bring it out then and we don't cut the road up and all that? And they were open to that. But as, you know, as the the landscape has changed. There's some people that don't have that experience. Certainly there's been enough subdivision on back roads where suddenly there's neighbors that don't appreciate the road being ruttered up. And so it just causes uh, one more, causes there to be one more challenge in terms of supply. Pests and diseases. Uh, this came up uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, I doubt there's anyone here who doesn't know, at least know someone who's had Lyme disease at this point. Certainly forest workers are particularly susceptible. I know quite a few people. I fortunately haven't had had it, but you know, this is a, a change. This was not something I ever thought about when I started working in the 80s. And I'd go so far as to tell you that I never in my life saw a tick till five or six years ago, but they're, they're not quite you know in my backyard yet, but uh, you know, they're sh turning up in places we never saw them. Uh, some of you know Vermonters like to come over to the Adirondacks to hunt deer, and I was in a deer camp by Tupper Lake this winter, and and we had one of our friends over from uh, the the Royalton Sheraton Sharon area, 
and he came back to camp with a tick and he's you know he's from tick country and he said look at this i never saw a tick a tick by tupper lake before so they're certainly there uh, my friend Erica Scott at the Northeast Center for Occupational Health and Safety and her colleague Amanda Room are doing a lot of work on this, particularly looking at impacts on uh, the logging community uh, of this. It's a pretty, you know, it's a, it's a pretty serious problem and one we we all need to be more aware of. In terms of invasive species, well, places we used to think were too cold and too immune are suddenly having invasive species issues. Uh, I talked to some public agency people who are doing things like tackling buckthorn. Fewer private landowners are willing to spend the money on this just yet, but it's a, it's a very real thing. This is a picture of uh, my daughter, and apart from her very excellent taste in music, she is she is um, she is very persistent in getting after knotweed. We had a lot of we had a patch of knotweed in North Faston, and we I think we endeared ourselves to some neighbors by taking it on and. Now I think we've won the battle. We'll see what we'll see what comes up in the spring. So, you know, I think when when Al first came to me with this idea that we should find out more about the climate impacts in the forest product supply chain, there was a thought that we need to be part of this conversation more. You know, the, these are frontline people. One of the one of the uh, really excellent people I spoke with said, I think as we confront climate change, that casting the forest products industry as a partner is important. And you know, he went on to say, these are the people with the skills and the aptitude and the people we have in place that may be able to help us build, you know, more resilient forests. Someone else told me, if you leave things to chance, you're going to fail. So I took about an hour one day to find a good picture of a chain binder to to go with that. Uh, in terms of the study that, that we did, and this was very much a qualitative study, we did have uh, an article published. Al Allison Berry was the lead author on this in Northern Woodlands, and there's a link, and I, and I think uh, Ellie included that in the um, webinar announcement. And just to point out, we did not pick the, we did not pick the title. Uh, other results, so there's climate adaptations in the Northeast forest product supply chain. I don't think think that the Forest Service has posted that anywhere, so it's at on my loggingchance.com website. The other publication is this kind of the briefer version of that and a little more interactive is this Northeastern Forest Products Supply Chain uh, Climate Adaptations Toolkit. So there's that link. And the bonus publication for Vermonters was this seasonal climate change in Vermont. So on a county level, we looked at all those, those kind of changes in, in temperature and precipitation that I showed you earlier. I did send this to FPR, hoping they might want to put it out on their website, but uh, no one ever got back to me, so I'm assuming that didn't happen. So that's that's on there. It did get my daughter did present it to the Vermont 4-H Environmental Conference a couple couple months ago. So what's next in this? Well, I I, I don't really know. I had uh, I was fortunate enough to have a fellowship last summer at the Property Environment and Environment Research Center in Montana because I uh, to work on a book. I, I've got so many great quotes from the people I spoke with that I really want to be able to share their story. And uh, the good thing that came out of the fellowship was that I, I realized what I should have known all along. It's hard to separate this idea of the climate adaptation from the larger story of changes in the in really the the forest products economy over time and, and what's gone on in, at the landscape level landscape level there. So this is a is about half written. Uh, you know, when you're in the forest products world and a paper mill blows up, well, you've got to come up with an immediate response, right, as we saw in the spring. But as things warm up or, or things get wetter over time, you have you have that opportunity to adapt. And we did document quite a bit of that. I was hopeful that we would, uh, you know, the next step would be to come up with a kind of a climate smart BMP not much water quality BMPs as, as direct responses to, to climate and operations and, and to demonstrate that. And uh, FPR in Vermont, uh, the, the folks in Connecticut and the, the DC in New York did, did uh, partner with me on a, on a landscape scale restoration grant application. And I think the last I knew we were 39th out of 40 on that list, so I don't think that was going to get funded. But that that idea for a project is still out there, and and uh, you know if it's a good idea, sooner or later it probably probably will get funded. 
So with that, I've told you uh, about this study, about uh, you know how we wanted to at least start looking at climate adaptations in the forest product supply chain. Talked about a number of things, but but did it at the forest management and and uh, harvest scheduling level. Talked about the logging operations and and then procurement strategies and how they've changed. So uh, with that, I, that's everything that I have to share. I'm going to leave my contact information up there, and I. Uh, Wonder if we have a few questions, Allie. That was wonderful, Steve. Thank you so much for that Thank great you. overview. Sure. Um, and I did put, um, I did as far as the the resources Steve mentioned, they are in the um, registration email, and then I just put in the chat box um, Steve's website, thelogginchance.com. Uh, so you can check that out. He's lots of good uh, resources uh, to poke around on there. Um, we do have some questions and, and keep them coming in if, if you have them or anything we talked about sparks some new questions. So for the first one, this is referencing right back at the beginning of your presentation where you showed the um, temperature uh, changes over time. So climate change effects. Um, you have uh, Southern New England and Pennsylvania lumped together. And there's a question where the Southern New, New York was lumped, like specifically the Catskills. Was that lumped? Um, in that Southern New England and, and Pennsylvania group, or or was it lumped with uh, Northern New England? It, it was it was lumped with the Northern Forest states. However, if you go back to say that um, that January map, where we still have uh, you think of that as traditional winters still, or the really cold winters, really the Catskills are going to going to behave a lot more like you know, Pennsylvania, certainly in my my conversations with people down there in Pennsylvania, it was sort of the same story. Uh, uh, start stop conditions for, for timber harvesting, uh, some real soil moisture challenges, absolute need to have a bulldozer on harvesting sites and that sort of thing. So it, yeah, it might better be be lumped with, uh, with Pennsylvania and Southern New England. Yeah, this is an issue when we look at climate data, it's thinking about how we aggregate. And so there, those are certainly uh, good things to be thinking about. Um, all right, the second question, next question is about snowpack. So specifically, it sounds like uh, the person asking question maybe is curious about how snowpack, the amount, the depth of snowpack, not just the presence or absence of snow. Like, is there a minimum snowpack that is needed for winter logging? And is that depth of snowpack uh, changing and affecting the amount of snow needed you know too, too much you know for winter logging too much snow can be a problem in inhibiting two things can inhibit the equipment but it also can prevent the frost from getting in the ground so you know there's there's probably a sweet spot of enough snow that you are or, or, or not too much snow you know enough to protect uh equipment from from the the irregularities in the tr terrain and rocks but if you get too much and you don't get any frost, you have a situation like that photo I showed where the, you know, there was a whole lot of skitter underneath the ground there, and we just saw the cab sticking out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, great. Okay. So this is a question very specific from Devin. He own, or sh uh, they own a small milling operation primarily for own timber framing purposes, um, but continually have slabs that need processing and are, are certainly usable. Uh, do you know if there's a possible outlet for these slabs? Like, is it is there possible to sell sell them or um, to a paper mill or anything like that? I, I guess I missed the first part of that. They're looking for, they have a specific pro product to sell? Yeah, it sounds like they have slabs from making timber for, for um, large, from large timbers. I don't know if they're hardwood or softwood, um, assuming okay, softwood, so they, but maybe not. Uh, is there an outlet for those slabs? I mean, I know sugar ma makers use those slabs a lot um, for running evaporators, but is there a way to sell those to a paper mill? You know that that's a, that's a good question. I, I I'd be hard pressed to believe they have enough for much of a supply. But if they chip, if they've got a chipper, you know, sawmill chips regularly go to to paper mills. But if they're better than that and can be dried, then you might want to look at a value added, dry them, smooth one side, and and sell them for you know, you know. Otherwise, it's going to be more of a break even, happy to get rid of them situation. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. And, he, and they said they are both hard and softwood. So, yep, maybe a value added product there, Devin. Um, 
All right, a question about a town forest is uh, typically logged in June and July. I don't know where this town is, but June, July logging. Uh, how much logging is generally done elsewhere in the summer versus winter? So how does that break apart as far as in, in Vermont or the region? So so there's probably more more logging done in the winter just because you have extent you have people who may be part-time at it they're going to be part-time in the winter because their other activities are idle you know uh, you know i don't know the situation but there certainly there are many situations where may and june logging would be really desirable from a civil cultural standpoint it's all it's also a challenge because often it's pretty wet then uh, i know if i'm trying to tackle a beach understory over here in the adirondacks i really want to cut it in june after it's leafed out and I seem to get less sprouting that way. So you know, maybe there may be very good reasons why it's going on then, but it's you know, it's hard to it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, during your interviews, Steve, did you get a sense for how climate change is impacting the number of existing logging businesses? For example, is it exacerbating the loss of logging businesses? Um, is it resulting in more part-time loggers or loggers that have to get second jobs? So, so you know, that's a hard thing to put a number on. Certainly, it's made it more of a challenge. And anytime you make it more of a challenge or, or have, you know, less of a profit margin, that's not really encouraging people to come into the business. So, you know, you know, I don't want to overstate climate's role there. It's one of the influences on that. You know, the cost of the equipment and the fact that there are easier ways to make a living probably uh, have a lot to do with it, but you, it's just kind of that cumulative, cumulative effect. If you really want to do it right and do a good job and it limits the number of days you can operate, well, then it, it's, it's pretty hard to make a, make a living at it. it. It's For many people, it's a lifestyle choice. They can make a living, but they can't get too far ahead. Yep, so like so many jobs these days, it seems like. Um, any recommendations for operation? Oh, operators that cut their wood with a buncher, put it down in the roads, then skid it with a grapple. This process gives the road little to no time to freeze in. Well, my recommendation would be to try to freeze it before you get there. And the, the, best, the best of the operators I know uh, at this phase in in such a way that, you know, Things are ready when they're, you know, the, the wood's cut maybe two weeks in a lot of cases before they move the skidders over there, they phase in. And these are big operations that can pull that off. They're really, they're really good at it. For uh, a two or three person operation where they can't be on multiple sites at once, that's a real, that's a real challenge. Uh, if you don't, you know, one is timing, be at the right place at the right time. And then within the wood lot, you know, take a look at, get the, get the um, UC Davis soil mapper, spend some time figuring out what are the, my best drain sites here? And you know, when should I be working there? And when should I plan? You know, if there's a if there's a site that you know is going to be hard to freeze, well, maybe start on the better site and spend some time freezing the other one before you skid on it. Good recommendations. Um, there is a comment here about uh, uh, road permissions during when they're posted, um, and that yes, that may, perhaps there is a, a statute um, that says that uh, road foremans are not allowed to provide temporary permission um, to overweight vehicles during mud seasons. So perhaps that's something that that changed um, recently since when you were talking about the ability to have a little bit more wiggle room there. Do you know anything if there's a legal statute about that? I, I, I don't know. I imagine it by state and locality. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of things, enforcement varies by that. And, you know, rule or not, uh, if there are reasonable people who, who will tell you, yeah, it's going to be 15 degrees tomorrow morning, you can you can truck out. Well, then I'm glad that's the case. Right. Yeah, certainly. Um, yep. Because once they post it, it's posted for a certain amount of time, but that doesn't account for, yeah, changes in, in, in the weather mm -hmm. within that, certainly. Well, it looks like we are at our time. And I just want to uh, take a chance to, again, thank Steve. Thank you all for attending. We had great attendance here over, I think there was a, over you know 85 people attending. Um, and like I mentioned at the beginning, there uh, will be a survey that will 
hopefully come up now. I'm not exactly sure how that happens, but it will also come into your email. Um, and in that survey, if you're interested in receiving continuing education credits, there's a couple little prompt questions. Please fill that out, what type of credit you need. Um, and then there is a follow-up question about license number. So check that out. It also, that follow-up email will also have the link um, if you want to share this uh, recording with anybody, watch it again. Again, it will be posted on demand. You can watch it. You can also get um, continuing education for Forester's license uh, credits um, on demand um, in the Vermont Forestry Webinar Library. So again, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks, Steve. That was a great presentation. Uh, we'll hopefully have you back again um, with some of your other work you talk about. We'll see. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great. All right. Take care, everyone. Whew.